Hello, and welcome to Go Ye Into All the World. I'm Pastor Scott Ingram of Mega Baptist Church in White Pine, Tennessee, and I'm very excited uh, to share with you today some facts um, about a, um, an ideal, uh, a thought that has continually been pressed throughout the internet uh, that I think we need to take a closer look at. For years, I have heard people say online and in person, whenever it's mentioned, uh, that the NKJV uses the same base text to translate the Greek and Hebrew of the Bible into the English that the KJV does, someone will inevitably share a, a meme or, or say uh, something like this. They'll say, no, 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 it does not. Uh, don't you know the NKJV removes words from the Bible? And then they will copy and paste or say this. NKJV omits the word Lord 66 times. NKJV omits the word God 51 times. NKJV omits the word heaven 50 times. NKJV omits the word repent 44 times. NKJV omits the word blood 23 times. NKJV omits the word hell 22 times. NKJV omits the word Jehovah entirely. NKJV omits the word New Testament entirely. NKJV omits the word damnation entirely. NKJV omits the word devils entirely. And my question is, and what I went to research about this is, is this true? Has anyone checked this out before they said it or copy or pasted it? Did they actually take the time to look into it? Well, I did take a time to look into it and I wanna take a moment and fact check and see if uh, it is true and if it is true, uh, let's keep sharing this with others to warn them about these scriptural deletions. This isn't. This doesn't sound good at all, does it? Uh, but if it isn't true, uh, then those who have shared this will need to repent according to the seventh commandment uh, given by the hand of God in Exodus 20, uh, verse 6. It states, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Now, please watch this into the end. Uh, no matter what I say uh, on a topic like this, it will cause uh, debate and uh, disturbance uh, to people. So uh, watch to the end. Hear the complete uh, video and uh, then, then share your comments below, please. Well, the first thing that comes to my mind is where did this come from? And you may be wondering that. How did so many people find this same list with these same numbers and have repeatedly copy and pasted them across the internet? There must be some source where they are getting this information from, even if they don't share the source with the copy and paste, right? Well, I discovered Gail Ripplinger is the source. If you don't know Gail Ripplinger, she is a lady who many years ago wrote a book called New Age Bible Versions. She since wrote several other books as well. Uh, many people found her book to be enlightening and have used it as a source for their studies on the differences in Bible translations. This list that is frequently repeated, copied, and pasted uh, is from one of her tracks on the NKJV. At the end of this track, uh, titled The Death Certificate for the NKJV is where she gives us this list. So when i seen that, I thought to myself, surely someone who had a hand in the making of the NKJV would have responded to her claims uh, since there is so much on the internet about this claim today. Well, it turns out that the main editor of the Old Testament of the New King James Version, Dr. James D. Price, got wind of this track and, and the claim of omissions years ago and uh, actually wrote a response to it uh, before the internet was as hot as it is now, you might say. This is what he said uh, specifically about Gail Ripplinger and her track. The title of this part of the track is New King James Omissions. This gives her unsuspecting readers the impression that she has documented places where the NKJV has failed to translate important Hebrew and Greek words of the Bible. That is, where the NKJV has left out important words. This is a false accusation without any confirmation or demonstration. The NKJV did not fail to translate any of the Hebrew or Greek words underlying the words and phrases she listed. She has wrongly used the term omission in the sense of translated by a different English word. This was done with the subversive intent of convincing her uninformed readers that the NKJV followed Hebrew and Greek texts different 
than the Textus Receptus used by the KJV translators. This concern about the NKJV using the same Hebrew and Greek words is also confirmed to us uh, in the preface of the NKJV too, where it clearly states that the NKJV uses the Textus Receptus as its base for translation. Yet many today still claim that this isn't true, and one merely needs to pick up a Strong's Concordance and compare the word to see that it is actually translating the same Hebrew and Greek text. So from three different sources, I have the editor of the NKJV saying it's using the received text. I have the preface of the Bible, uh, so the publishers say it's the same text. And Strong's Concordance, when compared outside of that, says it is the same text. So that makes three witnesses that no omissions to the Hebrew and Greek text were made, but we still wonder why were these translational choices made? Why would they choose to take heaven away or hell away or Lord away? What's that mean? It's still disturbing, isn't it? In the KJV and the NKJV, we are told of the Bereans who searched the scriptures daily to see if what they were being told about them was correct. And I think we should do that too. And you can do this with me as well for a fourth witness. As we go through these different words, I want you to go to Bible Gateway. And it allows for dual translations. You can put the KJV and the NKJV in there. And that way you can see this for yourself while considering what Dr. Price says about it and what Miss Ripplinger says about it. And I believe we're going to see what's going on here. Ripplinger states the NKJV omits the word Lord 66 times. Dr. Price says this statement is false for two reasons. One, the NKJV did not omit any words in the Hebrew or Greek text, but translated the underlying Hebrew and Greek words by English words different than the word Lord in the KJV. Okay. Uh, second, he says Ripplinger capitalized the first letter of the word, and he believes this was done to convince her unsuspecting readers that the NKJV omitted words referring to God, thus undermining his sovereign lordship. The NKJV chose to change the English word Lord when referring to people rather than to God in order to make the meaning more instantly understandable. And only four refer to God or Jesus Christ. Not a single instance, he says, undermines the sovereign lordship of God or Jesus Christ in the slightest way. Okay, let's take a look at this. In 17 places, the NKJV translated the Hebrew word there as master instead of the KJV, Lord. In two places, the NKJV translated another Hebrew word as master instead of the KJV, Lord. In one place, the NKJV translated another Hebrew word as prince instead of the KJV, Lord. In four places, the NKJV translated another Hebrew word as officer or captain instead of the KJV, Lord. Once, the NKJV translated an Aramaic word as nobles instead of the KJV, Lord. In 32 places, the NKJV translated another Greek word which can refer to God or when referring to mankind just as master, owner, or sir as master instead of the KJV, Lord. And twice, the NKJV translated that same Greek word as owner, uh, instead of the KJV, Lord. Once the NKJV translated that same Greek word as Sir instead of the KJV, Lord. Once the NKJV translated another Greek word as nobles instead of the KJV, Lord. Once the NKJV translated the Greek word Rabboni, meaning Rabbi, simply as the Greek word Rabboni instead of the KJV, Lord. Even though in this instance it was referring to Jesus, the NKJV translators felt that it was clear uh, by the Greek word that he was being referred to as the rabbi and not as God. And sometimes translators have to make tough decisions. Four times the NKJV transliterated the Hebrew divine name differently as Yah instead of the KJV Lord. So here we see the 66 times to which Ripplinger seems to be referring to. She doesn't say exactly what they were, uh, but Dr. Price uh, looked over the whole NKJV. He knows what they were, and he has given the reasons why these different translational choices were made. Ripplinger states the NKJV omits the word God 51 times. Dr. Price uh, says this. He says this is a subtle but false accusation given to persuade her uninformed readers that the NKJV deliberately undermines the place of God in the Bible. This is because the KJV used dynamic equivalent paraphrases, and he gives some examples of those, such as God forbid, God save the king, God speed, instead of a more literal expression in today's English. 
Twice the NKJV translated the Hebrew word meaning rock as rock instead of the KJV God. Eight times the NKJV translated the Hebrew word meaning far be it as far be it, certainly not, or by no means instead of the KJV God forbid. Eight times the NKJV translated the Hebrew word meaning let live as long live the king instead of the KJV God save the king. Four times the NKJV translated the Hebrew word meaning if only as if only or oh that instead of the KJV would to God. Five times the NKJV translated the Hebrew expression which is an idiom meaning oh that as oh that or if only instead of the KJV would God. Once the NKJV translated the Hebrew word meaning oh that or would that as if only instead of the KJV would God. Fourteen times the NKJV translated the Greek expression meaning let it not be so as certainly not instead of the KJV God forbid. Four times the NKJV translated the Greek word meaning to receive a divine oracle as divinely instructed or divinely warned instead of the KJV warned of God. Once the NKJV translated the Greek word meaning a divine response or oracle as divine response instead of the KJV answer of God. Once the NKJV translated the Greek word meaning a service as services instead of the KJV service of God. Twice the NKJV translated the Greek word meaning to greet as greet instead of the KJV bid God speed. Three times the NKJV changed the KJV from God to Lord because the Hebrew or Greek text actually has Lord and not God. Once the NKJV omits the phrase, the Lord thy God, which was added by the KJV in italics. For those not familiar with italics, the KJV and NKJV would add words in italics in order to let people discern when they are reading added words that are not in the original languages to help the understanding in the text. This phrase occurred two other times in the very same verse, and the NKJV translators believed that the KJV edition in italics was redundant and not necessary for the understanding of the text. So here we have 54 times that Dr. Price gave uh, for Miss Ripplinger's 51 times that she says that this was omitted. Miss Ripplinger states the NKJV omits the word heaven 50 times. Dr. Price said this is a false statement given to convince her unsuspecting readers that the NKJV is undermining the importance of God's celestial abode. Again, the truth is that no words in the Hebrew or Greek text were omitted. The NKJV here, he says, translated the words with different English words, in this case with the word heavens, sky, or air. And it would seem here where the main difference is concerning whether the plural or the singular view of heaven or heavens is being referred to here. Uh, the Hebrew word uh, for heaven or heavens is believed by modern scholars to occur only in the plural form and may refer to God's heavenly abode, to the realm of the earthly atmosphere, or to the realm of the stratosphere, or to the celestial realm of the stars. It would seem translators of times gone by uh, was only using sometimes the singular and sometimes the plural when it comes to heaven. But if you think about it, in reality, uh, heaven can also be perceived as plural when spoken as heaven. Um, so there's still, we don't know enough about what they believed about this. What we do know is how people perceive the word heaven and heavens now. Uh, and in modern uh, English usage, the singular form of the word heaven usually refers to God's home, and the plural form usually refers to the others. With that understanding, the KJV is not consistent in the use of the singular and plural form because it did not have that understanding at that time. Uh, the NKJV sought to make this more consistent and uh, up-to-date in the places where they believe confusion might occur. Thus, instead of undermining the importance of God's celestial abode, as, as Dr. Price has referred to it, the NKJV is actually trying to clarify places in the Bible where confusion about heaven might occur. In 47 places, the NKJV translated the Hebrew word as heavens instead of the KJV heaven for that same reason. Once the NKJV translated this word as sky instead of the KJV heaven. Three times the NKJV translated this word as air instead of the KJV heaven. Once the NKJV translated another Hebrew word meaning whirlwind as whirlwind instead of the KJV heaven. Once the NKJV translated another Hebrew word meaning cloud or sky as heavens instead of the KJV heaven. Once the NKJV translated the same word as sky 
instead of the KJV heaven. Here the reference is to the domain of the moon and the stars. Once the NKJV translated another Greek word meaning heaven or sky as sky instead of the KJV heaven. So here we have Dr. Price giving us 55 times this has been changed compared to what Ripplinger gave us 50 times. Ms. Ripplinger states the NKJV omits the word repent 44 times. Dr. Price says this is a false statement given to persuade her uninformed readers that the NKJV is undermining the important doctrine of repentance. And the truth, he says, is that no Hebrew or Greek texts were omitted. After clarifying that, Dr. Price gives the reasoning for sometimes using English words other than the KJV's usage of the English word repent to translate certain Hebrew and Greek words. He says the problem primarily centers around the word repent and the character of God. In modern English, the word repent conveys the idea of changing one's behavior from evil to good. In this sense, God cannot and does not repent. The scripture says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall not he do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Instead of undermining the doctrine of repentance, the NKJV, he says, strengthens the doctrine by clarifying places in the Bible where the doctrine could be confused. Now, when the KJV was originally translated, the word repent just meant to change direction or change your mind. It didn't always have the modern idea of changing from morally bad to good. In 26 places, the NKJV translated the Hebrew word meaning to be sorry or repent or relent as relent instead of the KJV, repent. Here, in all of these instances, the reference is to God changing his mind about some potential action, not to God repenting from some moral evil as is modernly understood. Uh, the NKJV is seeking to make the text more instantly understandable, while the KJV wasn't wrong at all in using the word repent uh, during that time, considering how people understood it uh, back when it was originally translated. In four places, the NKJV translated that same Hebrew word as be sorry or regret instead of the KJV's repent. Here again, the reference is to God being regretful of some past events, not to God repenting from some moral evil. In four places, the NKJV translated the same Hebrew word as have compassion or be moved to pity instead of the KJV repent. Here the reference is to God having compassion or pity on his servants, not to God repenting from some moral evil. The objects of the verb are people and not deeds. Once the NKJV translated the Hebrew word as change the mind instead of the KJV's repent. Here the reference is the Israelites possibly changing their minds about leaving Egypt when they encounter war, not to their repenting from sin or disobedience. Twice the NKJV translated this same Hebrew word as grieved instead of the KJV repent. Here the reference is to the Israelites grieving for the tribe of Benjamin because they had killed all the Benjamite women. The object of the verb is the surviving Benjamite men, not some sin or evil. The destruction of the Benjamite cities was done under the instruction of God. Once the NKJV translated the Greek word meaning to repent or relent as relent instead of the KJV repent. Here the reference is to God not changing his mind in the future about some act in the past, namely his oath by which he appointed Jesus as a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Once the NKJV translated that same Hebrew Greek word as relent instead of the KJV repent. Here the reference is to the Jews not changing their minds about believing the preaching of John the Baptist. Four times the NKJV translated the same Greek word as regret instead of the KJV repent. Once the NKJV translated that same Greek word as be remorseful instead of the KJV repent. So here Miss Ripplinger and Dr. Price have uh, hit it on the money both with 44 times uh, where they both saw this instance occurring. Miss Ripplinger states the NKJV omits the word blood 23 times. Dr. Price states this. He says this is a false statement given to convince her unsuspecting readers that the NKJV is undermining the important doctrine of the blood atonement. The truth, though, is that no words in the Hebrew or Greek text were omitted. Why did the NKJV use a different word then? Dr. Price continued, In nearly every instance the word used by the NKJV is a compound word containing blood as one of its components, such as bloodshed or blood guiltiness. In each case, the plural form of the word blood or other evidence from the context indicated that something more than mere blood was involved. 
So none of these incidents he is stating are related to the blood atonement. In 16 places, the NKJV translated the Hebrew word as bloodshed instead of the KJV blood. In five places, the NKJV translated this same Hebrew word as blood guilt or blood guiltiness instead of the KJV blood. Once the NKJV translated this same Hebrew word as life instead of the KJV blood. Once the NKJV translated this Hebrew word as bloodline instead of the KJV blood. Once the NKJV translated the Greek word as bloodshed instead of the KJV blood. Now you'll notice in every case but one, the English words are compound words that include blood as a component, and none of the instances had any bearing on the doctrine of the blood atonement. Here we have Miss Ripplinger stating 23 times, while Dr. Price gives an answer uh, 24 times. Miss Ripplinger states the NKJV omits the word hell 22 times. Uh, Dr. Price, he says this is a false statement giving to convince her uninformed readers that the NKJV is undermining the importance of hell and eternal punishment. The NKJV uh, chose here just to transliterate rather than to translate. Transliterate means to just present the word as it is in the Hebrew and Greek without translating it. So they chose not to translate certain words in the Greek and Hebrew that the KJV had translated as hell in order to maintain a proper distinction uh, between the words used in the Bible to refer to the place of the dead. Now, many people don't know this, uh, that sometimes uh, when it's referring to hell uh, within the KJV Bible, it's not always referring to the place of punishment. Sometimes it's referring simply to the place of the dead. Now, back when the KJV tr was translated, this was common practice to show it this way. Uh, but in modern English, the word hell means the place of punishment every time we mention it, right? Uh, for the wicked after death. However, the Hebrew word sheol uh, means either the grave or the place of the souls after death, whether righteous or wicked. Uh, so there can be a reference to hell in the sense of if it's for the wicked, but if it's for the good, then it's just the place of the dead. Uh, sheol would refer to in Hebrew. The KJV translators also understood this meaning, and the word hell was understood to mean either definition. The KJV translated the Hebrew word sheol as grave 31 times, as hell 31 times, and as pit 3 times. Now, it is possible for some to confuse that David in Psalm 1610 or 8613 and Jonah the prophet in Jonah 2.2 went to hell in the KJV without understanding that old understanding that it meant the grave or the place of the dead. When Jonah went into the belly of the whale, I'm sure it was like hell. And that's probably why the KJV translators translated it that way. But many people have misunderstood that to mean that Jonah actually went to hell uh, during that time and then came back from hell. So the NKJV believed it would make the text more instantly understandable if they would just not translate the word at all. They felt by not translating the word sheol with grave or hell or pit, it would be more instantly understandable uh, when making the distinction between sheol, the place of the departed dead in general, and hell, that place in sheol reserved for the punishment of the wicked. Where the context refers to the righteous after death or to the place itself, the NKJV transliterated uh, the word as a proper place name, Sheol. Where the context refers to the wicked dead, though, the NKJV translated the word along with the KJV as hell. Thirteen times the NKJV translated the Hebrew word Sheol as Sheol instead of the, translating it as the KJV hell. Here the reference is the place of the departed dead in general or to the place of the righteous dead. Four times the NKJV translated the Hebrew word as Sheol instead of translating it as the KJV grave. Uh, the rationalization for this was that the reference was to the place of the departed dead in general, not to the place where the bodies were buried as is understood by the word grave. Once the NKJV translated the Hebrew word Sheol instead of the KJV pit, the, here the reference is to the place of the departed dead. The translators felt that it would be more instantly understandable if the place should be referred to by its proper name as contained in the Hebrew text instead of by a synonym. 
Once the NKJV translated the Hebrew word Sheol as hail instead of the KJV gray. The rationalization here was that this was a reference to the place of the wicked dead, and not merely to the place where their bodies were buried. Now, when we get to the New Testament, uh, we come across the Greek word Hades, and it is the equivalent of the Hebrew word Sheol. It is also the word consistently used in the Septuagint, an ancient Greek translation of the Old Testament, uh, to translate that word Sheol. Some people have put the NKJV down uh, for using a word out of Greek mythology in the New Testament, but its relationship with Greek mythology is really of no consequence uh, because the translators of the Greek Old Testament and the writers of the Greek New Testament chose this word as the equivalent of the Hebrew word Sheol. This is what they wrote down. It means the place of the departed dead to them, uh, and should mean that to us, whether righteous or wicked, as Sheol meant in Hebrew, and not to uh, Greek mythology's definitions uh, within the world at that time. You should also know that the Greek New Testament uses two other words to specifically refer to the place of punishment of the wicked after death, and not at all to the place of the righteous dead. Those two words are Gehenna and Tartarus. The NKJV translators felt that it was important in a translation of the Bible not to obscure the distinction between these words, and therefore the NKJV translated the Greek word Hades as the proper place name Hades, and translated these other two words as hell in the New Testament. In ten places, the NKJV transliterated the Greek word Hades as Hades instead of the KJV, hell. Once the NKJV translated the Greek word Hades as the proper place name Hades instead of the KJV grave, this reference is to the place of the departed dead, not merely to the place where they were buried. Both the NKJV and KJV translated the word hell for Gehenna 12 times. Both the NKJV and the KJV translated the word hell for Tartaru once. So here we have Miss Ripplinger and Dr. Price both referencing 23 times, but we also have to remember the NKJV adds hell once where the KJV used the word grave. So here again is a uh, difference in their numbering of tw with this being 22 to her 23. Miss Ripplinger states the NKJV omits the word Jehovah entirely. Dr. Price says this is a false statement given to persuade her unsuspecting readers that the NKJV is in undermining the importance of the name of God in the Bible. The truth is that no Hebrew or Greek words were omitted. In seven places, the KJV translated the sacred Hebrew tetragram, YHWH, as Jehovah, instead of translating it as Lord. Now, it translated it as Lord over 6,000 other times in the rest of the KJV. The Hebrew name being designated only by the consonant letters of YHWH in Hebrew became so sacred among the ancient Jews that it was unlawful for them even to pronounce that name. Instead, they always substituted the Hebrew word meaning Lord in its place when they read the scriptures in public. This tradition was uh, continued consistently when the Hebrew Bible was translated into other languages, both ancient and modern. All translations used the word Lord in places of the sacred tetragram. You'll see this repeatedly. Oftentimes they'll do it in all capital, L-O-R-D. So where did the word Jehovah come from? Well, the name Jehovah is a hybrid word consisting of the consonants of the sacred tetragram, the YHWH or JHVH is borrowed in the German tradition, and the vowels a E, O, and a A are taken from the substitute Hebrew word Adonai, uh, the word Lord. So the hybrid word for God became Jehovah. It, it's a, a way to designate we're speaking God's name but it also shows that we're using the word Lord and we're not speaking it. As the Hebrews did so long ago in choosing not to speak his name out of reverence. According to Dr. James Price, this pronunciation of Jehovah was unknown until A.D. 1520 when it was introduced by Galatinus, the confessor of uh, Pope Leo X. 
The hybrid name was historically used in the English Bible in seven places. Now, the translators of the American Standard Version of 1901 actually chose to translate the sacred name of Jehovah in each of the over 6,000 instances where it occurs at. The HCSB uh, chose to translate it in some places, but not at all as uh, as Jehovah, but as a, uh, a new instance that has come about. Uh, Yahweh is how it's pronounced to some people today, which is what some co- scholars believe is the correct pronunciation. No one really knows what the pronunciation of the word is supposed to be. It's just this is assumed. The decision in the ASV of 1901 was reversed in the New American Standard Version, so the New American Standard Version no longer contains the name Jehovah, and the NKJV translators did not feel they should use Jehovah or Yahweh and uh, chose to simply uh, continue translating all references to God as the name Lord. Thus, this is why uh, Jehovah is not seen in the NKJV. Ms. Ripplinger states the NKJV omits the word New Testament entirely. Dr. Price says this is a false statement given to convince her uninformed readers uh, that the NKJV is undermining the importance of the New Testament scriptures. The truth is that no words in the Greek text were omitted. The Greek word in question here means a testament, will, or a covenant. And the KJV translated this word as testament 13 times and as covenant 20 times but not consistently. In those places where the reference is to a will or testament, the English word testament um, it seemed to be appropriate by the NKJV translators. But in those places where the reference is to a covenant between God and man, or between men, the English word covenant, they felt was more appropriate and gives a better distinction, is more instantly understandable. The NKJV followed this convention in order to make the text more instantly understandable and avoid confusion. In six places, the NKJV translated the Greek word meaning New Covenant or New Testament as New Covenant instead of the KJV New Testament. Uh, Here the reference is to the New Covenant between God and mankind mentioned by Jeremiah in Jeremiah 31, 31-34, and is cited in Hebrews 10, 16-17. It's not a reference at all to the New Testament scriptures or to a last will and testament. It's referring to a, a covenant between God and man. Elsewhere, in similar context, the KJV translated these same Greek words as New Covenant three times. So the reason was to make it more understandable that uh, we were talking about this special covenant between God and man. Ms. Riblinger states the NKJV omits the word damnation entirely. Dr. Price says this is a false statement given to convince her unsuspecting readers that the NKJV is undermining the importance of the internal punishment of the wicked. The truth is that no words in the Greek text were omitted. In seven places, the NKJV translated the Greek word meaning condemnation or judgment as condemnation or judgment instead of the KJV damnation. The reason being that the reference is to the judicial condemnation and pronunciation of judgment rather than on ultimate damnation, meaning going to hell. Uh, This does not deny ultimate damnation uh, because when judgment has been pronounced, damnation is bound to follow. These are the only places where the KJV translated this word so. Elsewhere, in similar context, the KJV translated this word as condemnation five times and as judgment 13 times. The reference is believed by the NKJV translators to be to the judicial condemnation and pronunciation of judgment rather than on ultimate damnation. In three places, the NKJV translated another Greek word meaning condemnation or judgment as condemnation instead of the KJV damnation. These three passages are the only places where the KJV translated as damnation. Elsewhere, in similar context, the KJV translated the word as condemnation three times and as judgment 41 times. Once the NKJV translated another Greek word meaning destruction as destruction instead of the KJV damnation. 
This is the only place where the KJV translated this word so. Elsewhere, in similar context, the KJV translated this word as destruction five times and as perdition eight times. So, this was a different translational choice not to remove the idea of damnation from the Bible, but to give a more instantly understandable view of the text to the modern ear. Miss Ripplinger states the NKJV omits the word devils entirely. Dr. Price says this. He says this is a false statement given to persuade her uninformed readers that the NKJV is undermining the importance of Satan and demons. The truth is that no words in the Greek text were omitted. The reasoning in this is because of how we understand the word devil today. According to the scripture, there's only one devil, Satan. In modern English, the, the other evil spirits are referred to as demons. Uh, the Greek New Testament used the word diablos to refer to the devil, Satan, and the Greek word daemon to refer to demon and the plural form for demons. The NKJV felt it would be more instantly understandable to distinguish these words in English as they are distinguished in Greek to make the text more instantly understandable and to gather when it's speaking of the devil and when it's speaking of the demons. In 43 places, the NKJV translated the plural form of the Greek word daemon as demons instead of the KJV devils. In 20 places, the NKJV translated the singular form of the word demon instead of the KJV devil. Likewise, in 12 places, the NKJV translated the Greek words meaning possessed or vexed by demons as demon possessed instead of the KJV use of devil or devils. In four places in the Old Testament, the NKJV translated the Hebrew words that refer to demons as demons instead of the KJV devils. After taking this journey to search out the scriptures, who do you believe is acting like the devil? What do we know about the devil? He's been a liar since the beginning, right? So who is telling the truth? Is this track telling the truth about the NKJV? Is Dr. Price and Strong's Concordance and uh, the preface, the publishers of the New King James Version, are they telling the truth? Uh, what is the truth? Um, I'll leave that up to you. And uh, please uh, tell me what you think is the truth. You can uh, leave a comment here on this video, or uh, you can send an email to Omega B A P T Church at gmail.com. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this issue, and I hope this uh, video was helpful for you in uh, clarifying what's being said when those uh, familiar copy and paste are taking place across the internet. I hope you're enjoying the sermons here and have subscribed to my channel on YouTube, but I would love even more to meet with you in person at the church where I'm blessed to pastor at in White Pine, Tennessee, Omega Baptist Church. We are a Bible-believing church called to love all people without bias by proclaiming and teaching the Word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. We are located directly off of Exit 4 off of Interstate 81 in Tennessee. You can see us clearly from the interstate. We have worship each Sunday at 1030 and I hope you'll make plans to join us. It's all about Jesus, my friend, and we pray that we may be able to have the opportunity to share with you personally the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ.